Hi there, this is Mr. H again. I'm going to continue with 910, a September 11th story uh, by Nora Raleigh Baskin. And so this is part four of this series. I'm going to be reading to you out of chapter two. So let's get going. So once again, uh, I, I don't think I mentioned before, this book does not have illustrations. Um, otherwise, I'd probably be showing you those pictures. Um, and on the pages at the start of each chapter, instead of a, a chapter title, um, or where it says chapter two. Uh, instead, uh, there's this print that tells us kind of where things are happening and when they're happening, which is the setting. So in this case, this part of the story is happening on September 10th, 2001. It's 6.45 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's what EDT stands for. And in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And I know many of you uh, hearing this are thinking, Pennsylvania, wait, where's that? And then Shanksville? because people know Pittsburgh or they know Philadelphia, uh, but they don't know Shanksville perhaps. So here, let's take a look at a map. So here we go, the map of the United States, and you can see all kinds of things here. Find your state, give you a moment. Can you find where you live? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm in uh, Springfield, Oregon over here. So there's uh, where, where we are, that's not in the story, but I wanted to be able to give you some perspective. So the first uh, part of the story happens at an airport, remember? And that airport is here in Chicago, Illinois. And so there's Illinois right there. And Chicago is this really big city that's uh, right next to Lake Michigan. So that's where you would find that on the map. And uh, farther over to the right, you might see the state of Pennsylvania in kind of the light green color and Shanksville be right about there. So hopefully that gives you some idea of where in the United States these different events are happening. And we'll return to this map as we uh, have different things happening in our book. All right, so moving on back to the story. And so here is the second chapter. Will's sisters were already in their usual spots at the kitchen table, arguing over the positioning of a cereal box for the best viewing when he made his way down for breakfast. Coffee? His mother handed him a mug. Thanks, Will said. He turned to Rooney and Callie. What's so important about the fruity pebbles? There's a game on the back, Rooney whined. Yeah, and it's my turn. Callie shifted the box in her direction. Rooney yanked it back. Okay, that's enough. Will stepped over and lifted the box off the table. Now no one gets to play. The girls didn't seem to mind. They both quieted and returned to slurping down their bowls of pastel-colored leftover milk. Thanks, Will. His mother wanted to say more. Will could tell, but she knew better than to heap compliments on him that felt like obligations. He was the quiet type, just as his dad had been. Too much conversation had made them both, now just Will, uncomfortable. Maybe his mother wanted to tell Will how great he had been ever since you know when. Maybe she was going to thank him for picking up the slack, helping out with the house and the girls. He had even tried to help her with the mountains of paperwork and red tape that had been dumped on them in order to get survivor benefits from the trucking company. Will had certainly stepped up. Everyone said so. He heard it all the time. He was the best son any mother could ever hope to have in a situation like this. A young father dying, so randomly, so violently, leaving behind a wife and three children. But that was the thing he'd left them. Because the truth was that Will's father should never have died. It didn't have to happen. All his father had had to do was call in the accident on his CB. And if he'd really wanted to do something, if he'd really had to do something, he could have sat in his truck and waited for help to arrive. How many times had he himself warned Will Nothing good happens on the road after midnight. There are too many bad drivers out there. Will's dad was not one of them. In his 18 years of long distance hauling, he had never gotten a serious infraction, never even gotten a speeding ticket. Maybe this made this all the more ironic. It certainly seemed more unfair. It was unfair and it was wrong. 
Will's father would often be on the road for days, sometimes weeks. And so when he came home, it always felt like a vacation for all of them, even if Will and the girls at school and their mom still went to work. It changed the atmosphere in the house to something festive. It was a holiday just to have him home. It didn't hurt that their dad always brought presents from wherever he had been. California, Nevada, New Jersey, South Carolina, little things, maybe something from a truck stop or a diner or a Holiday Inn, a pack of cards for one of the girls, a Kachina doll for the other, a matchbox car for Will, a plastic ring that came inside a plastic egg for their mom, and she would wear it all day. Sometimes just a folded map or a paper menu from a restaurant with an interesting history, or a pack of gum but he always had something for each of them every time, until he didn't come home at all. The state troopers showed up at their door before any of them had a chance to wonder where he was or why he hadn't called in before he had reached his next checkpoint. No one was missing him. None of them knew enough to wonder why the police were knocking. Mrs. Rittenhouse? The short one took off his hat. Looking back, Will thought, Will thought that should have been a warning sign. The tall one had his eyes down until he had to speak. Mrs. Frank Rittenhouse, he asked. But after that, it was a blur. It was pretty much a blur. Bits and pieces of information and images no one would want taking up residence in one's brain. Apparently, Will's dad had been on his way home after being on the road for two and a half weeks, making the trip home from Denver, when he saw a car not quite pulled over on the side of the interstate, and the driver, a man clearly in distress, slumped over the steering wheel. Smoke was coming from under the hood. Most likely, he had hit a deer. Never pull over on the side of the interstate. It's dangerous. Always try to find a rest stop, an exit, or a bypass road. Your husband was trying to help, the tall one said. But of course, it was all speculation. That's what those state troopers did, put together accident scenes based on the physical evidence. Fur and blood in the grill of the first car. Tire tracks, amount, and location of damage to both cars. In this case, they figured Will's dad had seen a fellow motorist in trouble, stopped his rig a few feet ahead of the disabled car, walked over, been about to open the driver's door to see what was wrong when another car came racing down the highway. Your dad was a hero, the state trooper went on, but Will could tell he didn't mean it. A hero? It was a stupid thing his father had done, getting out of his truck, standing on the side of the interstate that way. He had warned his own family against doing that hundreds of times. If they were out in their station wagon and he saw someone changing a tire by the side of the road, he would roll down his window. Don't do that, mister. It's dangerous. Call a tow. The state troopers went on to describe briefly how the oncoming car hit the disabled vehicle and sent it into the side of the rocky embankment with Will's dad pinned between them. Listening, Will and his mom remained silent. The girls went upstairs. It had been over quickly, the troopers were certain. He was a hero, they repeated that. And then Will's mother asked the strangest question. What happened to the man in the car? The one that hit them, ma'am? No, she said. The man my husband was trying to help. Both troopers seemed to breathe in simultaneously like they had a long day ahead of them, a long, unpleasant day. They could have more houses to visit, more news to deliver, or maybe this was their only assignment for the whole day and it was already too much. Finally, the short one spoke. He died, ma'am. They both died. So it was all for nothing. He didn't eat anything, Will's mom was saying. It would upset her more if he didn't eat. She'd feel like a bad mother. She needed to feel useful. It had been a full year since they lost their dad, about the time people start to get past their grief, but no one, it seemed, had bothered to tell that to Will's family. I'll take an English muffin if you make one. I gotta go back up and get my sneakers, Will said. His mother burst into action, fussing, like a frantic chicken. She was almost more at ease when she was rushing about nervously. When Will came back downstairs, she was standing with his breakfast wrapped in foil. You're so good to me, she said. 
So he hadn't fooled anyone pretending to be hungry. His mother kissed him on the cheek and then pushed him toward the front door. There was an invisible wall between the world out there where his father's death wasn't ever present and the world in here where it always was. Will felt it blocking him, tugging at him every time he had to leave the house. Then out the window, Will could see the flash of school bus, sorry, then out the window, Will could see the flash of school bus yellow through the trees and his heart jumped a tiny beat faster. His feet unstuck. He stepped outside. Claire would be on his, Claire would be on the bus.